Uh, well, if you were here last week, uh, you might remember uh, and recall the two young boys who had two very different uh, outlooks and views on life. Uh, today, it is the little girl uh, who went to church with her parents one Sunday morning and uh, instead of putting the uh, offering that she was given into the offering plate as it comes before her uh, in the middle of the service and as her parents trained her to do, she held on to it. And after the service, uh, she went up to her pastor and she said to him, here, I want you to have this. And the pastor, who was kind of a self-important guy to begin with, said, well, I'm very flattered and I know that you want to give it to me, uh, but you should really put it in the offering. And, and she insisted, she said, no, you should have this because my daddy says that you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. <laughs> You know, some of you have heard that story two or three times from me, but you still love it. <laughs> and it does bring us once again uh, to today's passage from uh, Matthew chapter 22, which is curiously one of my favorites. Uh, it is an important passage because it does say something about our money and uh, what we do with it and how we use it and who we give it to and the way in which it reflects what's really important to us, what really matters to us, what we really care about, uh, which really ought to come as no surprise uh, to any of us, given that almost half of the parables of Jesus in the New Testament Gospels have to do with our money or our possessions in one way or another, not to mention all the other uh, passages that speak to it in the course of the pages of Holy Scripture, uh, which is to say that my money and what I do with it is primarily a spiritual issue, even though we don't always like to uh, talk about it or even think about it in that way. I also like this passage because it takes us to the intersection of religion and politics, uh, which is also a struggle uh, for many of us and something that we don't like to think about or talk about. And finally, I love this passage because it illustrates the shrewdness of Jesus, uh, who in the midst of his grace... Uh, puts people into the trap that they set for him, and in doing so, teaches me some of the most important lessons of a lifetime. Uh, the context, just by way of uh, review, is a, a religious and spiritual interview of Jesus by two very powerful and very different groups of people, one of which was religious and the other, other of which was political. The religious group, of course, is known as the Pharisees, and they were the keepers, the interpreters, and in some ways the makers of religious laws for the children of Israel. The Pharisees despised the occupying forces of the Roman Empire, which had invaded their fatherland. But they were also threatened by the ministry of Jesus by his message of the kingdom, because it threatened their spiritual authority, their way of life, their legal, legal judicial approach uh, to getting right with God. The other group uh, was known as the Herodians. Uh, they were not religious. They were a political party supporting the rule and the reign of King Herod, who was this brutal, arrogant uh, kind of puppet king of the Roman Empire. The Rodians didn't care about uh, religion at all, but they too were threatened by the ministry of Jesus because of his immense and growing popularity, and they were uh, afraid that that popularity would translate into the overthrow of the Roman Empire. And so the Pharisees actually hated the Herodians uh, for reasons that you can probably imagine, and yet it became one of those situations where uh, the enemy of my enemy is now my friend, and the two of them formed this very unlikely coalition to undermine the ministry of Jesus. And they do it by setting a trap for him, by asking him a question, and the question has to do with money, and specifically about the payment of taxes. After trying to butter him up a little bit, they say to him, is it lawful to pay tax?" to the Roman emperor, or not. Uh, now, it may interest you to know that uh, in the first century, uh, the people of Israel actually paid a lot of taxes. Uh, there was the required temple tax, which was an annual uh, tax that had to be uh, paid for the operation, admittance to the temple. 
in addition to uh, whatever you paid for the sacrifices uh, for your sins that you made at the temple. In addition to the temple tax, there were several different Herodian taxes. Taxes on land, taxes on crops, taxes on roads, taxes on transportation, and many other things. Uh, But the one tax that they hated more than any other was the imperial tax, known as the head tax or the poll tax or the census, because that was the tax that went to the emperor. This is probably the tax that Mary and Joseph uh, had to travel to Bethlehem for, to register for the census or the imperial tax. And they hated this tax because they hated the emperor. Not to mention the fact that the imperial tax could not be paid with their sacred Jewish currency, known as the shekel, but had to be paid with the required Roman denarius, with his graven image of Tiberius Caesar and his name and title on that coin. And so when Jesus is asked this question about who you give your money to, about the payment of taxes, it was designed to put him into an inescapable position. Because if Jesus answered the question uh, by saying, yes, you must pay the tax, and you should, uh, he would have represented himself as being at least uh, under the authority of the uh, emperor, who had, to add insult to injury, set himself up and defined himself as a son of God. And that would have gotten on the last spiritual nerve of the people of Israel. And it would have meant that Jesus was also requiring them to be disobedient to the prohibition of against handling graven images. And it would also have gotten on their last uh, uh, spiritual nerve because it went straight to the whole issue of loyalty to God. And so if Jesus would have said, yes, you should pay this tax, he would have been alienating the very people he was trying to reach with the good news of the kingdom. And that is exactly what the Pharisees wanted. On the other hand, if he would have said, no, do not pay the tax, is against your religion. He would have been immediately committing an act of blatant rebellion against the Roman Empire, subjecting himself to arrest, cutting short his mission before it was accomplished, and ending whatever political power was attributed to him, which is what the Herodians wanted. And so this question about money and the payment of taxes was designed to put him into a losing position no matter how he answers. But as I said, Jesus is shrewd. He's not just a nice guy who gets along no matter what. And so there is a third option that he exercises. And he begins to exercise it by going on the offensive and calling the Herodians and the Pharisees a bunch of hypocrites. After which he calls for the coin that is used to pay the imperial tax. And they produce a Roman denarius. And he looks at it and he starts to get out of the trap by asking a rhetorical question. Well, whose head is this? Whose title is this? In the King James Version of the Bible, uh, the word he uses is image. Whose image is this? The Greek word of which is icon. Whose icon is this? And they say, well, it's the emperor's. And then Jesus says, well, then if it's his image, his icon, his name, his title, it must belong to him. Now, some of you probably haven't noticed this, but uh, when I was in England uh, a few weeks ago, I lost several pounds. Because when you go to a foreign country and you use their currency, you are acknowledging their sovereignty, their ownership, their kingdom. And so Jesus says, give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor. We're living on his kingdom. But give to God the icons of God. Give to God the images of God. Give to God the things that belong to God, which express his sovereignty, his ownership, his kingdom. And with that, the Pharisees and the Herodians walk away. 
their goal has been unmet. Their mission has not been accomplished. Now, many of you here uh, today who are longtime members of St. Andrew uh, are undoubtedly thinking of the passing of Pastor Jerry Coleman, uh, who was here before my uh, time but made a significant impact during uh, his few years as associate pastor here at St. Andrew in the early uh, 1990s. Uh, Jerry Coleman, uh, in addition to being a pastor, was also a musician and a composer. The most uh, noted of his hymns is entitled, The Lamb, uh, which we will sing this morning during the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Also, by way of trivia, uh, I can tell you that the very first time I ever in my whole life laid eyes on the Lutheran Church of St. Andrew was the day I went there to have lunch with Jerry Coleman. But the reason I mention him to you in this moment is that I only heard Jerry preach like maybe two times ever, and one of those two times was actually a sermon about money. It was a sermon on the amount, although a different text. And in that sermon, Jerry said something that I always remember, and I've quoted him many times. He said, Jesus doesn't want your money. Jesus wants your heart. And if Jesus really has your heart, then the mission of Jesus will have all the money it needs to do what Jesus wants us to do. And so when Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, give to God what belongs to God, he's not talking simply about money. He's talking about our hearts. He's talking about people who were created in the image of God who at the dawn of creation said, let us create humankind in our own image so that women and men and girls and boys are the icons of God in this world today, who in holy baptism have also been given the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that when Jesus says, give to God what belongs to God, he's saying, give God you everything that you are and everything that you have. And so at the end of the day, you know, this passage uh, isn't just about uh, Jesus uh, answering a tricky questions about the payment of taxes or about the intersection between religion and politics or about getting you to give more money because what you do with your money reflects what's important to you, what matters to you, what you really care about, or even about winning a debate with the Pharisees and the Herodians, although he does accomplish all of those things. But what this passage really does is settle the issue of who I really am, what I am worth to him, what the purpose and the mission of my life really is with respect to my time, my talent, my treasures. And it also settles the issue of his lordship, his sovereignty, his ownership of my life, which a lot of people have not settled because they think that their life actually belongs to them but not when you're an icon of God. And your life becomes a thank offering to God, an expression of gratitude to God by the way I live, by the way I worship, by what I do with my money, with what, uh, well, how I live out my citizenship in response to the grace and the goodness of the one who does not charge me a tax to enter into his temple, but sets me free so that I can offer my life and everything about it and everything in it back to God in gratitude and in love to God. And so I have already mentioned, as uh, many of you know, that uh, next year we'll mark the 75th anniversary of our congregation. And as part of our celebration, uh, there will be a capital funding effort to raise a large financial harvest as a part of our gratitude, our thanks to God. 
and uh, that harvest uh, will respond in part uh, to the needs of our 15-year-old uh, church facility, uh, which literally has some foundational issues as this building settles down on its property. And uh, there are also uh, the realities that our heating and air conditioning and audiovisual systems are now entering uh, the last phase of their natural lives. Uh, there are some issues with the roof and the parking lot and the need for permanent signs out on New Hampshire Avenue and Norwood Road and, and also the opportunity for the latest technologies, and including lighting that will be good for our eyes and also good for the environment and a number of other things. And you're going to be hearing about uh, them as uh, time goes on. And all of it will require uh, tremendous effort, a lot of sacrifice, great generosity which we know because we have done this before for the glory of God. And so from time to time, because we have done this before, I will get a call from the leaders of a sister congregation and they will ask me the question, well, how do you do this? You know, how do you accomplish such a thing? And I could talk about the process a lot, and I do. But in recent times I have begun by saying, you know, it really just comes down to one thing. Be the kind of church that people love. Be the kind of church where people feel love. Where they feel the love of Jesus and the love of his family. Because you give to the one you love. When you love, you give. When you love, you serve. When you love, you sacrifice. When you love, you say thank you to the one who does not charge you a tax to be part of his family, but paid for it in full so that you can freely enjoy your life as a child of the kingdom of God in Christ. And isn't it interesting that the one who brings us this message today is none other than Matthew, the tax collector of all people, the one who betrayed his religion the one who followed the political powers of the Roman Empire and abused his own people in the process. It was Matthew who gives us this lesson and who did all of those things until Jesus comes along, changes his life with grace at his cross, makes him an icon of God and a child of the kingdom. And that is what you are a child of the kingdom who by God's grace now has the joy and privilege before the service, during the service, after the service, every day of your life of going to Jesus and saying to him, I want you to have this because you became the poorest of all so that I can enjoy the riches of your grace because I am yours I belong to you. I am the child of the kingdom, and you are the Lord of my life forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus to the day of everlasting life. Amen.